and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're back into our verse-by-verse preaching series uh, going through 1 Peter right now. We're in chapter 3. We're starting at verse number 13. I've entitled the message today, A Holy Attitude. And everybody said? Uh, Everyone said? All right, that's a little better. Let's stand together as we read the word. 1 Peter 3, verse 13. And he, who, who is he, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. Do not be afraid of their heart, of, of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it's the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that we're right here at this spot in our, in our, in our series of preaching and teaching. We pray your blessing over the message, Lord. I know you put some things on my heart. Help me to proclaim and preach your word, Lord, the way you want. Let it be received, applied. In the process, Lord, be glorified. As we sang, Lord, show us your glory, but be glorified in the proclamation of your word today here in the house here on live stream and down the line as people watch it on social media. Let this be a great message for people to grow in their faith. And may your church be edified and encouraged as a result. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Uh, How many of you know Chuck Swindoll? Great preacher, teacher. Uh, He's he's been quoted as saying, uh, we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. Life is 10% what happens and 90% how we react to it. Our attitude is everything. I think I agree with that. I mean, life happens to all of us, but our reaction to it really determines what happens with our lives. Let me give you uh, the Oxford Dictionary definition of attitude. A settled way of thinking about someone or something, typically, one that is reflected in a person's behavior. So our mind, the way we think, affects the things that we do. Um, I remember my dad and probably my football coaches in high school would always say things like, wipe that attitude off your face. Or if you don't knock that chip off your shoulder, I'm gonna do it. But they were talking about a bad attitude. And it seems like we all had a bad attitude at one time, but but Peter here is talking about a good attitude. Um, uh, Peter, I I love this idea. Peter, as we all are familiar with the Peter in the Gospels, young, rebellious, quick-tempered, little rough around the edges and opinionated as just an opinionated person. But now sometime later in life, wiser, a little more seasoned, a little more pastoral, he's giving some great counsel on how to live your life in the midst of difficulties. He, what he's saying basically is your attitude will determine your success as a true follower of Christ. In case you don't know yet, uh, life is not going to be a bowl of cherries just because you received Jesus. Now, I'm glad if you did, and we should receive Jesus, but don't think that everything's going to be easy because Jesus is in your life. Everything will be worth it, but life sometimes is difficult. And our attitude and and things that happen determines how we progress uh, in this life. I just remembered that Bethany and Joe were here. Bethany's going to have her baby this week. (laughs) Joe Joe is rubbing that oven, saying the oven's getting ready to, it's ready to go here. Let's pray real quick. Father, bless Bethany and baby. Bless this family, Lord. Let the baby come without any complications and just bring a a blessing into this family. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Verse number 16 talks about having a good conscience or good, good thoughts, good insights, a good attitude about yourself and about your relationship with God and with other people. 
So I want to give you a little background here in order to get into this properly. A few weeks ago, we were talking about how Peter was addressing the idea of submission, the submission of the believer. If you go back to chapter 2, and uh, maybe you should go there, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, very key scriptures there. And from chapter 2, 4 and 5, all the way to right where we are today, Peter has been addressing the subject of submitting to God and submitting to others. But in, in verses 4 and 5, he says, we, we're coming to Christ as Christ is a living stone. We're coming to a living Savior. And we also are like living stones coming to the living stone who is now building us up into a holy priesthood. Uh, he, he's doing a work in our lives. We're, we're, he's building a spiritual house. And in that concept of being built up and growing as a spiritual person, we are called to offer spiritual sacrifices. How many of you remember we talked about spiritual sacrifices? We, we spent a lot of time on that. But the spiritual sacrifices come in the form of submitting to God, if you think back, to God, to the government, to our boss, to our spouses, and to one another. So our spiritual sacrifices is this living unto God and, and, and surrendering, our, surrendering our will to every authority over our lives. Let me give you a, a quick definition of submission in case you forgot. Um, Uh, let's see. <laughs> well, I'm just going to have to read it. I, I wrote this. I should know. <laughs> Submission, to yield and to humbly come under an authority other than yourself. That's what we were saying. So we talked about being under the submission of God. And in that, in that little passage, abstain from fleshly lusts, immorality, you know, uh, fleshly things that you do, but submit to God. Submit to government, he goes into, unless the government uh, opposes the higher law of Christ. Submit to your boss at work. Submit to your spouse and submit to one another. And, uh, and now he, in verses 13 to 17, he's saying not so much what to do, but what kind of attitude to have when you do it. And so we're going to go verse by verse like we usually do. And uh, if time permits, I want to give you four steps in developing a holy attitude. And everybody said. Amen. Now, if your spouse is here, or maybe not, but wouldn't you want your spouse to have a holy attitude? Wouldn't you want the person next to you to have a holy attitude? Listen, life is 10%. How we react to it is 90. So attitude is basically everything. So, okay, let's start at verse number 13. Now, remember, this is like after a, a chapter and a half of teaching on submitting. And so he says, who, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? What is good is, is the way of life that we've been talking about already. Submitting to God, submitting to government, submitting to your boss, submitting to your wife or your husband, submitting to one another. You know, offering spiritual sacrifice. That's what he's referring to as we're followers of what is good. This is a good thing that we're doing. We're following Christ. We're following the way of Christ. So on the one hand, I think Peter might be saying, uh, we're pursuing a higher calling here. We're following Christ. What does it matter if anyone harms us or tries to harm us? Because we're above all of that. In one hand, we're above all that. And even if we were physically hurt in the process, my mind goes to the first martyr, Stephen, in Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, when, when Stephen was on trial and, and uh, he was getting ready to be stoned to death for his faith, but they looked at him and he had a face like an angel. And he was stoned to death, but he gloriously went to heaven and, and Christ received him. And so even in death, there's a blessing so who could harm you? Because we're, we have a higher standard that we're going by. But then I think also he might be meaning, well, who could harm you? Well, in reality, if you think about it in chapter 1, verse 1, he's writing to the pilgrims, those that are moving around of the dispersion. You know why they're being dispersed? Because they're being persecuted. So who could harm you? Well, the government could. The, the government was harming them. Other religious groups could. 
uh, maybe some liberal Christians that don't get, get the same doctrine you have, but, but yeah, a lot of different ways you could be persecuted. So Peter's addressing the issue at the time. And I think in the back of Peter's mind, he's remembering, say, Matthew, that Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher. A servant is not above his master. He said in John's gospel, and Peter was there, Jesus said, if they persecute me, guess what? They're going to persecute you. So I realized, okay, this is first century. I get it. It's all good. But I'm always looking for application in the word of God. And so I believe that this also applies to the persecuted church of today. One of the, one of the areas of missions emphasis that we do have is to support the persecuted church in various countries. But then I think, you know, as people are imprisoned or have hardships in other countries, some are killed for their faith today. But I think about the USA, and I would say this, that if we take a stand for Jesus, there's also consequences for us, especially nowadays. There's scorn, there's ridicule, there's disrespect, there's a loss of reputation. And I think verse 13 is saying, you know what? If you're living for Christ, if you're offering spiritual sacrifices, if you're submitted to God, you're trying your best to live a godly life, you're obeying the law of the land the best you can, even on the highway, amen? You know, you're, you're doing the best you can with your spouse, with your family, with your church, you're submitted. So who could persecute you? You know, what, what, what could, who could come against you? Who could harm you if you're following this higher calling? I think that's what he's saying in verse 13. But then verse 14, which is a follow-up, he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, righteousness' sake, righteousness' sake, suffer for doing the right things, not the wrong things. Many of us have a history of suffering for doing the wrong things, and that's understandable. But now we're, we're saying, no, we might suffer for doing all the right things. Anyone ever been in that place? You do everything you think is right, and the bottom falls out of your situation. And you say, Lord, what happened? I didn't do anything, but life happens. But if you, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, in other words, you're living for Jesus, you're offering the spiritual sacrifices, you're, you live a submitted life. And ironically, it says you're blessed. Wow. In the Greek, that word blessed means you're, you, you, you're fortunate and you're happy. It's almost like what I would call poetic justice. You know what poetic justice is? It's like when something bad happens, but something good comes out of it. Here they're being persecuted, and you would think they'd be all sad and down in the dumps and you know, all confused or whatever, but, but opposite of that, they're blessed for being persecuted. I find... I find great strength in this concept here. And then Peter, interestingly, the fisherman, quotes from Isaiah chapter 8. He says, uh, don't, be, uh, don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. He's quoting from what the, what the prophet said to Israel, saying, look, people will come against you, but don't fear, don't be troubled. God is greater than your problems and your issues. I read in Hebrews 11, some of the Old Testament saints, it says some very difficult things about those Old Testament believers. Some were mocked, some were scourged, some were chained and put in prison, some were destitute and afflicted, yet they all died in faith. So I think he's saying, verses 13 and 14, okay, what, what harm can come to you? I mean, in, in the greater faith concept, the worst thing that could happen is you die and go to heaven, so hallelujah. Not that I'm saying I want to do that, but I hope that if it came to that point, I would do that. But if there's ridicule, more like in America, there's ridicule, there's other stuff happening emotionally. You know what? God is greater. And consider it a, a badge of honor. Didn't Paul and Silas say that? I, we were considered, we were happy because we were considered worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. So verse 14, even if we do suffer, uh, we're not a second-rate Christian. Hello. Some people might feel discouraged or, why me? No, no. Actually, you've been elevated to the elite club of believer. You're, you're, you're counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. Let me, let me bring it home. It may happen in your family. It may happen with your mother or your father or your brothers or sisters or your relatives that don't understand faith. 
you may get mocked or you may be ridiculed in some way. So then let's go down to verse number 15. He says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. I want to encourage you to sanctify Christ in your heart. Sanctify means to consecrate, set apart. Let Jesus be the main thing in your heart, in your life. I wanted to raise the question, and I raise this every now and then. Are you, are you simply dancing around the cross? Are you enjoying the fellowship of the saints, even the preaching of the word? Like King Herod loved when John the Baptist preached the word. He never submitted to it, but he enjoyed it. Do you enjoy the fellowship of the saints and different things that we might do? Or are you on the cross? See, the Lord is calling us not to be around the cross. He's calling us to be on the cross because when we die with him, then we truly live with him. So we, we come to the living stone. We're living stones being created, being molded into the people of God that he wants us to be. So verse number 15 He's saying here, sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready to defend your, the hope that's in you. Chapter 1 says we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why are we like the way we are? Not because we're so smart or so talented or gifted. We're like the way we are because the resurrection power of Christ lives in us. We have a living hope. But the question is, can you defend that? I don't mean intellectually. The greatest way to defend our faith is, you know what, is a changed life. Just to live differently, think differently, present yourself differently. And, and he says, you know, uh, be ready to give your uh, defense for the, to anyone that, 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 uh, that mocks you or whatever, but do it with meekness and do it with the fear of God. Don't do it with arrogance or with pride. That would totally defeat the purpose. But do it humbly before the Lord. So if you, if you plan on living in verse number 15, we have to do verses 13 and 14 first. It kind of all goes together here. So verse 15, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that's it, that is in you with meekness and fear. I go back to chapter 2 and verse 9 where Peter says, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation called out of darkness to walk in the light, to give God the praise and the glory. I, I heard a sermon this week. Actually, it was by, um, it was by I, don't think, I don't know his name, the pastor of Times Square Church. There's a new, relatively new pastor there. The name of the message was, what does singing have to do with worship? And I thought about that. And he said, you know what? The very first instance of worship mentioned in the word of God was when, when uh, Abraham offered his son Isaac on the altar as an act of worship. There was no singing at that point, but it was a sacrificial giving of your heart to the Lord. That's worship. It could happen at your, jo at your job. It could happen at your table at home. It could happen at Market Basket when someone's getting on your nerves. I'm not the only one, hello. But, you know, see, this, this, this happens in life, but we worship God. We're called out of darkness to live in the light, to give God the glory and the praise. And I like how this all goes together. In verse number 16, having a good conscience, being right with God, right with other people, um, if they try to defame you or mock you or belittle you or worse than that, you could say, you know what? I'm okay. The old man, I'm going to knock that guy's block off. <laughs> the new man, I'm okay with that. I'm just going to have to walk away and stay out of that trouble. But, but see, you know, we have a good conscience. Uh, you're going to be okay. And your, your good conduct will shame the others that want to rob your joy and rob your testimony. I remember my mom used to say all the time, whenever I came home with the problem, she'd say, Ricky, kill them with kindness. I'd say, Ma, I want to do work. I want to, I want to knock their block off. No, no, kill them with kindness. It's going to be okay. Paul said in Romans 12, he said, you know, remember, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. 
You know, uh, let your light shine. Love those that hurt you. Love those that do bad to you. Um, and when you do that, it's like keeping hot coals on their neck or on their head. I like that analogy. It's almost like it's some satisfaction. I'm not going to do anything, but God's going to get them, you know. God's going to bring down hot coals on their head. <laughs> So verse number 17, just a summary. It's better, uh, notice it says, if this is the will of God, I, I want to just talk about that. Maybe it's the will of God that we suffer. Maybe it's not. Maybe some of us will and some of us won't, or some of us will more than others. But if it's the will of God, if we're going to suffer, just remember, it's better if we suffer for doing the right things instead of getting that stupid speeding ticket. That was the wrong thing. Oh, I'm so, I have to go to court and pay a fine. Oh, poor, poor me. Well, you know, you deserve it. <laughs> but if you're suffering for the right thing, you're blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yes. Whew, where am I? <laughs> suffering for your faith, characterized by being misunderstood, being ostracized or criticized by people, being marginalized, or you know, worse, le worse yet, being left out of a conversation, being spoken about, being lied about. These are all ways that we're kind of suffering persecution for the Lord. But again, 10% of, of life is what happens to us. 90% is how we respond to it. And I'm telling you here, a, a, as a Christian person, we are called in a higher position. We're called to a higher place. Now, let's say verse 13. Who is he that will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Has anyone ever been there where someone starts to belittle you for your faith? Or verse number 14, or if you suffer? And, you know, my, my reaction is, so you could, I could suffer, it's okay. But don't you dare talk about my family. I'm really going to get you now, even as a Christian. I'll, I'll do that. I'll repent later. You know, I'll go to, I'll go, I'll take care of this. That, that's just the way I am. You know, I'll give you some slack. First couple of years of your salvation, okay. After a while, that's got to go. That doesn't really, now I know it creeps up every now and then. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, you know, it, it's got to go. That's not the right way. Verse 15, what well, it says, sanctify the Lord in your heart. Always be ready. I'm not, when that guy cuts me off, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for this guy's market basket that's bugging me the whole time. I, I'm not ready. But we have to be ready. You know, we have to get ready. And be meek, meek and be, be, you know, don't get angry, but be humble about the whole thing. Forget about uh, verse 16. Forget about uh, having a good conscience. I don't care about my good conscience sometimes. I'm acting in the moment. You hurt my wife, man, I'm going to get you. I'll defend you, Pamela. <laughs> but <laughs> we're talking about ministry now. <laughs> all right, I won't go there. <laughs> uh, all right, so anyway, let's get into our four points, okay? I want to give you four things to hang your hat on, all right? The first, th I mean, if you want to develop a, a holy attitude, and we really should all be striving for the holy attitude. Because none of us have a perfect life. None of us, you know, none of us have a you know, cookie cutter thing where everything's perfect. And I don't know anyone like that. We all have issues and things happen to us. I mean, my, my prayer many times is, Lord, I was just minding my own business and this came my way. What did I do? Nothing. Just deal with it. Okay. But I realize what, what God is doing, he's changing my heart. I've said this a lot of times. My heart won't change unless I'm put under the pressure. Because I'm pretty happy the way I am in my ugliness sometimes. <laughs> but when I, when I know things happen, I know God's trying. It's not about that person or that situation. It's about me. In the long run, I, I'm the one standing before God, how I dealt with issues and things in my life. So the first, the first step in develop a, developing a holy attitude would be verse number 13. Make sure that you're following the right plan. You know, there's a lot of plans out there. Get rich quick, you know. Uh, inner healing in five easy lessons. Uh, five ways to be successful in your business or self-help plans. I'm not against all of that, but the, the real thing is the right plan is the plan of Jesus Christ. That's the right plan. 
And I, I would even go a step farther because even within the plan of Jesus Christ in the church of the Lord, there's different little subgroups that are a little bit off on a tangent. But follow the right plan. You know, I don't, I don't want anyone to feel guilty if you're not healed of your physical problem. Do I believe in divine healing? 100%. But I believe it's in God's way and in God's timing. Don't feel guilty if you're not healed right now or whatever, or you've got to take some medication for this or for that. Follow the plan. Maybe God is using all of that stuff in your life to get here. Who knows what God is doing? Who knows? But stick with the plan. And I go back to chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The plan is we've come to a living stone. Why did we come to a living stone? I came to a living stone. I didn't know he was a living stone at the time, but I was desperate for something in my life. I realized my life was not happening. It was not good. I was miserable, basically. I came to a living stone, and then I found out I'm, I'm like a living stone going to the living stone. And he's building in me who he wants me to be. I love that. Look, I, I said it earlier, we've been with the Lord, what, 47 years this year, right? 1977. I'm in the same place I always have been. I mean, hopefully I'm a little better, but I mean, I, I'm still depending on God. I'm still in the plan. You see what I mean? I'm not on a tangent somewhere. I know some guys went off on a tangent. They went so far on a tangent, they never came back. I don't know where they are. <laughs> they disappeared. But I, but I can say, uh, humbly, we're, we're in the plan. We're on the, on the course. We're serving God. We're doing the best we can. We're keeping it kind of simple. I like, I like simple, it's better. And just continuing to go with the Lord. So we could say from chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, I better hurry up here. Oh, my goodness. So we're following Christ, correct? Yes. We're living stones, correct? Yes. We're being built up as a spiritual house. Yes. Okay. We're, we're a holy nation. Yes. So we offer spiritual sacrifices. Yes. We're submitted to everything and everybody. So we have, we have this desire to have a holy attitude. We have to get with the program and continue doing what God has called us to do. All of this produces a holy attitude. I'm going to abbreviate a little bit here. Go to number two. If we want a holy attitude... We have to understand suffering. I, I don't know. I don't know. I want to just say suffering is not a bad word. Everybody I know suffered, suffers. Everybody I know suffers. Is it from God all the time? Probably not. Is it from sinfulness? Maybe. Jesus said, you know, when, when the apostles asked him, why is this person blind? He said, you know, he didn't do anything wrong. It's, it's so God could be glorified. Really? So sometimes suffering is something that God allows to break our heart and to make us desperate for him. We've got to understand, you know, suffering is not, a, is not God's condemnation on us. Uh, we want a healthy, holy attitude. We've got to understand sometimes God uses sufferings. Uh, look at chapter 1 real quick. I, I know I read this before, but chapter 1 and verse 6 it says, in this we greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been, give, you've been grieved by various trials. I always was perplexed by the if need be. Lord, I need to be going through this now? Yeah. Why? So that when Jesus comes back, the genuineness of your faith will be exposed. Otherwise, you won't get there. Okay, I could deal with that. Chapter 5, verse 10. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you suffered a while, what? No, that must be a misprint. <laughs> After you suffer a while, he'll perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Oh, my goodness. I'm just saying sometimes God uses sufferings physically, emotionally, whatever, relationally, to get to this right here, get to our heart. Continue to pray for your healing. I'll pray with you, too. One of the worst things I've seen over the years is someone who gets a physical healing and never comes back to church again. Never serves the Lord anymore. They've just been healed or whatever. Really? Well, I just want to encourage you. If you're going through some suffering, I mean, we're all in it in some capacity. Let God use the suffering to perfect you and identify with Jesus. 
Number three is this. Consecrate Jesus in your heart. I liked what Brother Jesse said last week when he was preaching. He said, you know, sometimes Christian people have an identity. It's the wrong identity. They'll identi identify with their sickness or their medication. Remember he said something like that? Like that's the main thing of who they are. I'm saying, I know that's true, but that shouldn't be like that. I mean, I know a lot of people that are sick, and sometimes I take medication too. But my main identity is with Jesus Christ. I, I may have a, di like last year, I had a diagnosis that I've been healed of, thank the Lord. But I, I didn't go around saying, you know, that's who I am. No, that, that's what I have. That's not who I am. You know? So, back in the day, I, I had to consecrate Jesus in my heart. Uh, I had to realize it was more than my guitar, more than music more than going out and party, and I had to consecrate Christ in my heart. It was more than playing baseball. I was a big baseball player back in the day. I was gonna be the next shortstop on the New York Yankees. No, I had to put all that away, you know? I thought maybe I made more money and whatever, traveled or whatever. Then I realized Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things you're worried about will be added to you. Seek God first. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since you've been raised with Christ, you're born again. Seek those things that are above, not things on the earth. Lift your, sight, your, height, your sights up higher than where you are. Amen. Consecrate Christ in your life. Does he have the preeminence in your life? Philippians 2 says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Is money your God? No, that's got to go. Money's not bad. Money's good. But the love of money uh, over the love of God is not good. Galatians 5, the works of the flesh, sexual immorality, different things that we would do sexually or, or sensuality, those types of things, or, or stealing or hurting people or being angry, all these different things. All this has to go. Where is Jesus in your life? Here, if you want to live, uh, if you want to have a holy attitude, Christ has got to be consecrated in your life. May I say, every single day this has to happen. Sometimes I wake up saying, oh Lord, I don't want to even face the day. I've got to consecrate my, my life with you before I even get out of bed in the morning. Come on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh yeah. I like a song. Uh, Dion sang a song. Uh, Jesus is the center of my life. Great song. I'm going to have to post that. In verse 15, you know, sanctify the Lord in your heart and be ready to give a defense. Don't be ready to beat someone over the head with your Bible and make them become a Christian. No, just be able to defend your, the hope that's in you. Why are you so positive? Why are you so happy? Why are you so optimistic? Why? Man, I don't know what's going on. All I know is Jesus is in my life. And with Christ, I'm going to be okay. I like what Tim Tebow said. He quoted something a few years ago. He said, I don't know what my future holds, but I know who holds my future. Because in his life, Christ was consecrated in his heart. Didn't matter what was happening as far as football or whatever he was doing. All right, so let me see. I'm getting lost here. Let me give you number four. If we want to have a holy attitude, we have to maintain a good conscience. I just kind of studied that principle and uh, there's so many scriptures that talk about having a good conscience. Like Paul said in Acts 24, verse 16, he said to the high priest, I always strive to have a good conscience without offense toward God or men. That's a good scripture. We should strive to do that too. Strive to, strive to have a good conscience. That's, that's Acts 24, 16. Romans 9, 1 says, uh, my conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit regarding my passion for the Jews. So here you have his mind and spirit working together. I like that idea. 2 Corinthians 1.12 says, Our boasting is, is in this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves simply and godly in your midst. So how's your conscience? There's nothing really better than a good conscience. When you put your head on your pillow, are you feeling good about your day? Do you feel like you did okay? This is what he's saying. Have a good conscience. Have, ha, have peace with God. Have peace in your heart. If there's an issue with the person, do your best to work it out. You know, Paul said in Romans 12, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. I take that to mean sometimes it ain't going to happen. 
Not on my part, but on their part. If that's the case, oh well. But I'm, as for me, I'm good. 1 Timothy 3.9 says, um, hold the mystery of faith in a clean and pure conscience. So let me just summarize here real quickly. Life, according to Chuck Swindoll, is 10% of what happens to you and 90% how you deal with it. So in summary, if you want to have a holy attitude, a Christian attitude, follow the right plan. Surrender to Jesus. Go to church. Get involved in the Bible studies. Come out when there's things going on. Uh, the ladies had the meeting the other night at the house. Well, the men had a Zoom meeting the other night, too. And, and we did pretty good, too. <laughs> but yeah, these are things that are available for you. You know, make this part of your plan. This is what we do. This is what, as Christian people, we follow the right plan. The right plan is always be in the word, always praying, always trying to do the right thing, following the way of Christ. Secondly, understand suffering. If you need a doctor, go to a doctor. It's okay. You know, uh, I've been asked over the years, should I go to my, should I stop seeing my doctor? I don't give that information. I don't give that counsel. I don't know. I don't know. Pray. I would say God uses doctors, but there may be times when you shouldn't go to a doctor, but that's up for you and the Lord to decide. But understand suffering. Maybe God's trying to get to something beyond your physical pain. He's getting to, to something in your heart, in your spirit. Consecrate Jesus in your heart. I think that's probably the most important thing. Run after God. Seek God. You know? Pray every day. I don't want to ask you to raise your hand, but I hope some people are joining me at 6 o'clock in the morning praying, not in person, hallelujah, but as I'm getting up and praying, I'm over there praying, I'm trusting people are getting up out of your bed and, you know, you don't even have to brush your teeth. Just go to prayer. And, and we're praying together, even though we're not together, but we're praying in this, you know, and spiritually we're, we're together, praying together. I find it to be so important to do that. It's a discipline it's so necessary to do. If you need someone to pray with you, call me up. I'd be happy to pray with you. I pray with people on the phone sometimes or meet them over here, whatever. And then the fourth one is to maintain a good conscience. You know, if you, if you sin, confess it to Jesus. If you hurt somebody, tell them you're sorry and move on with it. You know, just have a, have a good conscience. So why don't we stand together? We're going uh, to read, let's see, verse number 15, right? Can we read that together? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's say it again. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15. Right? Okay. Every head bowed for just a moment. As I said it in the beginning, we just happen to be at this point in the preaching series. This isn't meant for anybody in particular. It's meant for all of us in general. But I wonder if there's some here today, and if you just raise your hand, if you're dealing with an issue, maybe a family member or someone at work, and, and your faith has been put under the microscope, and you need prayer, you need God to help you deal with those issues. Anyone at all need that? Okay, a couple of hands. All right, I'm gonna pray in just a second. And now, the other side of that is also applicable. If you've never been scorned or ridiculed or mocked for your faith, if no one even knows that you're a Christian, maybe it's time for you to step up a little bit. Not to be braggadocious, I'm not, not saying that at all, but I'm saying to live your life in such a way without even saying anything that people would know that you belong to a, a living Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you this too, and anyone online, is there anyone here that needs to either accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or
come back to a living relationship with him. Anyone like that at all? Raise your hand if that's you. Yes, thank you over there. Thank you over there, very good. Okay, I'm gonna ask everyone to repeat this prayer of invitation after me, and then I'm gonna pray in general. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. I believe that you're calling me to surrender to your Lordship, to be submitted to you, your word, and to your church. I know that I'm a sinner. I know Jesus is a savior. And right now, I confess my sins to you, Lord. I open my heart. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and cause me to be born again. And if necessary, born again, again. I welcome your Holy Spirit to fill me and to guide me. In Christ's name I pray. I'm going to pray for you. Father God, thank you for this time in the service. I pray for those that raise their hands to uh, renew their covenant with you. May your Holy Spirit, even now as we pray, minister to them in a special way. But Lord, for those that are dealing with issues at work or with family or feeling tension because of their faith, we just pray your blessing to be there, your guidance to be there, your wisdom to be there, to know how to handle it. We pray, Lord, for others that have never experienced that, that maybe it's time to step up our walk a little bit, walk a little bit closer to you, and maybe say or not say or do or not do certain things that would reflect the God that we serve. So we ask you, Lord, guide us and direct our steps in those areas. So thank you, Lord. We pray as we leave this place today that we would be on the way to developing a holy attitude no matter what life throws at us. As your children, Lord, we are called for this. Th these difficult times could be our finest moments as men and women of God. Fill us and guide us, and we give you all the thanks and all the praise for it. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, baptism at 4.30, prayer meeting at 6 online. If you said that prayer and you raised your hand, I'd love to talk to you before you go home today. God bless you.